Hi, I'm Alex Paulton. and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Talking Time Pieces, where we talk about watch collecting and horology. Today, I thought um, we should go over how to tell time on watches with hands. Uh, I was uh, watching Teddy Baldazar, who's a great channel, you should watch it yourself, and he was talking to some young people about watch styles and trying to get a feel for what they thought about watches and um, the style of watches and wearing watches, and it came out that several of them couldn't read uh, time, couldn't tell time on a watch with hands. And it's not because they're dumb, it's because they hadn't had the opportunity to learn. And I know there are a lot of young people out there who would like to get into the hobby of uh, collecting watches and are interested in watches, but are intimidated by the fact that no, nobody ever bothered to tell them how to read a time on a watch with hands, and maybe by this time they're kind of embarrassed to check. So. What we're going to do here is we're going to start with two hands and we're going to use the collection and we're going to talk about how you can tell time on a watch with hands from two hands to multiple hands. So that way we cover everything from the basics to, uh, you know, a calendar perpetual, I mean, or an annual calendar flyback chronograph or something along those lines, uh, which I happen to have so you can see. So, but before we do a close up on the watches themselves, I wanted to do a little bit of a basic uh, primer on the aspect of uh, telling time and why we use hands and how the hands are actually an analog representation of our day, right? Because if you think about uh, on the planet, you're standing on the planet, right? Human being on the planet, right? And you see the sun come up in the morning, goes overhead to noon, middle of the day, which even if you didn't have a clock, it's kind of obvious the middle of the day, sun's directly overhead, boom, high noon easy uh, concept to understand. When the sun is directly overhead, it's noon. When it goes down, it's sunset. When it comes up, it's sunrise. Now, that passage of time during the day dominated human thought for, of course, ever, right? And once humanity developed the opportunity to create mechanisms to time that the mechanisms mimicked what they saw, right? So the very first clocks just had one hand. And 12 represented high noon, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 10, 11, 12, right? And so the clock would... The hand would move through the day, mimicking the passage of the sun in the sky. When the sun was at noon, the clock hand was at noon. And then, conversely, it would flip over at night, right? Midnight was the middle of the night. Midnight. So, the clock, 12 hours daytime, 12 hours nighttime. Now, eventually, the technology got good enough that we could then track the minutes. So, we added another hand. But if you go to pictures of old medieval clocks and all, they only have one hand. Uh, there are companies like Meistersinger. I do a, did a review of a Meistersinger. There are companies that still do one-handed watches, but uh, that's more of a style thing and not because they have to, because the technology's not there. First-generation clocks were barely accurate to within the hour, as it were. But uh, once we had the, the, the technology to actually accurately divide the hours and minutes up, we took separate hands to do that. So separate minute hand, and then eventually a separate second hand. Now, the hour hand is short and stubby, the minute hand is long and slender, and the second hand is just a thin line. And part of that has to do with the fact that the minute hand is continuously moving. I mean, the second hand is continuously moving, so it needs to be light and thin so that the mechanism can move it around the dial, as it were. So that's the basics on a clock face. Now, the nice thing about a clock representation is it also allows you to think about time in an analog fashion, right? So if um, you see, for example, it's two o'clock and it's uh, already 20 after two, which would be uh, four, you could guess that in about 15 minutes, just by looking at the face of the clock, 
it's going to start getting on to be uh, 7, 8 o'clock. So without actually doing math, adding, subtracting, you could just look at the arcs on the clock. And using the arcs on the clock, you can say, well, uh, it's uh, 20 minutes till, half past, quarter after, quarter till. And that's what people have those terms. It's a quarter till, half past, because they thought of the time as an analog representation. The sun is moving through the sky, the clock is moving around the face of the dial. Now, if you add start functions like, say, a stopwatch, right, then you have to add little sub-windows. So you're going to have hours, oops, actually hours is a shorthand, right, so you'll have hours, you'll have minutes. Um, in the case of a chronograph, most chronographs do not have a central second hand. One or more, well actually not more, but one of these um, subdials will be will have what they call the running second hand. And that's the second hand that's constantly turning. Then the central second hand on a chronograph is for the stopwatch. Because that's what the that's what a chronograph is. It's a watch that has the ability to be used as a stopwatch as well to time events. So it would then have, say, for example, a minute subdial. So the second hand on the stopwatch would go around. The minute subdial would register minutes. Hour subdial to measure hours. And this is the running seconds. But that pattern can change depending on the chronograph. So the thing is you have to start recognizing what the various features are on a watch and what they should be telling you. But at the end of the day, most watches will have a straight two-hand layout at its core and then add other information on the dial. There are watches like, uh, for example, a regulator which doesn't have a traditional layout, but we'll look at that a little bit more closely when we flip the camera around. In fact, uh, I'm not a very good artist, and uh, we'll just go ahead and go straight to the watches, and we'll pull various watches out of the uh, collection and use them as examples of uh, how to tell time on watches with hands with various complications. Okay, so uh, let's flip the camera around. So, let's uh, take a look at this two-handed watch. As I was saying, the uh, hand's movement mimic the rotation of the earth and the uh, sun rising and falling. And so, it not only gives you the time, it allows you to perform uh, mental computations about time, you know. Um, yes, if you have a digital display and it's uh, you want to know what 20 minutes from now you just add 20 minutes but an analog display allows you to have a a feel for the time as it were because it is an analog presentation of the information and not just a digital presentation of the information because since the analog by definition represents the real world more closely um, it can provide you with more information than just the time. But let's start by talking about the time. And uh, as you see, 1 to 12, representing half of the day, because uh, as I pointed out, um, people were fixated on noon as being, of course, the middle of the day, 12 o'clock, high noon, as it were. So the clock is a 12 hour clock. Uh, comes from the base 60 mathematics of the Babylonians. Um, we can get into how an ancient civilization in sandals and uh, breech cloths managed to come up with sophisticated mathematics, but that's a different discussion. But uh, essentially, the day is split up into 24 hours. The hours are split up into 60 minutes, and those minutes are split up into 60 seconds, just like uh, 360 degrees in a circle Base 60 math. The way uh, you read a watch or a clock or a clock face is um, you look at the uh, big hand, which is the minute hand, and the short hand, which is the hour hand, 
to um, just read off the time that it is pointing to. So in the case of the day, as we were saying, 12 hours in a half a day, 24 hours in a full day, with noon as the center point, the uh, hour hand tracks those 12 hour segments. So at noon, the little hand is pointed at 12. At midnight, the little hand is pointed at 12. And then during the day, it's pointed at the various hours, five for five o'clock, nine for nine o'clock, right? So three o'clock. Now, the minute hand has to be on the 12 for it to be the full hour, right? So three o'clock. Four o'clock, the minute hand takes an hour to go around. Five o'clock, another hour to go around. Six o'clock. Now, so the short hand tells you the hours. The long hand tells you the minutes, as you see, it takes an hour to go around. So, seven o'clock, seven oh five, seven ten. See, now when we talk about the minutes, if you notice, I'm not reading five. This is 25 because now, since we're talking about the 60 minutes of the hour, you have to remember that each of these numbers is five minute increments, right? So five times 12 is 60, right? So 25 after 7.30. Now, one of the things about analog is in the old timey days, people would actually then look at it as fractions of the hour. So this was half past seven or half to eight. Uh, here in Germany, uh, they say half to eight. In America, they say half past seven. It depends on your cultural focus. But the minute hand tracks the minutes within the hour. So you have to uh, just visualize on a watch with um, 1 to 12, the uh, minute track. And uh, here, I'll give you an example of a minute track so you can see what I mean. Here's, uh, here's, a, here's the Boulder um, Medio 360 Diver. Very nice piece, by the way. I'm, I just recently acquired it. I'm going to do a uh, review of it. But if you notice, it has an outer minute track. Um, the reason it has an outer minute track is as a diving watch, you can use this outer track to time events. See, so I could put it here on the minute hand. I could put it here on the minute hand and then it shows elapsed time from that point along the minute track. But another aspect of the uh, ooh, nice, I like this bezel action, nice and clean and tight. So. Uh, one of the other things about the minute track, though, is that it allows you to see the actual, the actual minute tracking. 5 minutes, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, uh, and around. So the long hand tracks the minutes of the hour. So the short hand tracks the hours. The long hand tracks the minutes. Now, the big difference between a what they call a two-handed watch and what they call a three-handed watch is the second hand. Now, in this case, the second hand is visible. They call this a lollipop second hand, even though it's rectangular on the end. Some lollipops are rectangular because it's got a luminous ball, or in this case, a luminous rectangle, at the end of the second hand. A lot of watches uh, with second hands do not have uh, balls on the end for luminous uh, paint application. So in this case, they were serious about you knowing the actual time elapsement. So our hand takes 12 hours to go around. So it takes two trips around the face every day. The minute hand tracks the minutes. So it does a full circle of the face every hour. And the second hand tracks the minutes and does a full circle of the face every minute. Now, there are a lot of other types of faces and things on the face. And so for the next step up, I would say the most common uh, fourth hand that you will find in a watch would be a GMT hand. In this case, we've got the uh, Explorer 2. And uh, this hand is the GMT hand. 
marked red so you can tell the difference at a glance between it and the hour hand, the minute hand, and the second hand. And in this case, it points to this outer bezel. Now, it's not always going to be an outer bezel. It could be an inner bezel. It could be printing on the face, but there will be a second hand, I mean, in this case, a fourth hand pointing to the uh, time zone. I'm wearing, for example, my uh, Breitling GMT. And if you notice, it has a red hand that's also pointing at an inner track. The gold painted letters are the GMT time. So this is also a watch with hour, minute, second, and GMT hand, but it also has a chronograph set, which I'll get to in a second. But we were talking about GMT hands. So in this case, this hand goes around the face once every 24 hours. So basically it goes around half as fast as the hour hand to track 24 hour time instead of 12 hour time. Now in some watches that hand is slaved to the hour hand and you have to turn the outer bezel. But in the case of the, uh, Rolex Explorer 2 and some of the other higher end. For example, my Breitling does not do it because it's an etabase. I shouldn't say because it's an etabase, you could probably modify an etabase to have jumping hours, but it would be uh, expensive. But in the case of the uh, Rolex, if you notice while the second hand is moving, I can jump the hour hand around. And that's for uh, travelers and people who really need to uh, know where they are and the time where they're going or the time where they've been. So that's hour hand, minute hand, GM second hand, and GMT hand. So now let's look at a watch with a chronograph and a second hand and um, various dates. Okay. So if you notice here, there are date windows. Here's a date window for the month. Here's a date window for the day. And usually if a watch is showing you the month and the day, but not the weekday, it's an annual calendar because a weekday um, is on a lot of watches. This watch, for example, this Longines has a day of the week, day of the month, and the month. And this is uh, an Eta base, but Longines had it modified with a column wheel but it also has a chronograph dial set. So once we get past hour hand, minute hand, and now on this watch, where's the second hand? This is not the second hand. This, nope, sorry, this is the second hand. On different watches, it's different uh, hands. Uh, in the subdials on a chronograph, but the way you can tell which is the second hand is if the chronograph's not running, the running seconds is the second hand. In the case of this Longines, the running second hand is on the left. Part of the two-part uh, subdial on the, at the nine o'clock showing uh, a 24-hour time and the second hand. You see, so once you start talking about chronographs, they can get creative with the subdials to present information, but just remember, you're still talking about hours, minutes, and seconds. And in a chronograph, we're now also talking about the ability to use the watch as a stopwatch. So in this case, I've got the running seconds of the clock, right? The running seconds of the clock. I've got the hour hand, the short hand, the minute hand, the long hand. So right now it's 20 to nine or 40 after eight, but now once you get within the half hours, most people say the fraction before. So this is 20 to nine. And uh, the seconds, you don't have to worry about telling anybody the seconds on the 16th of April. Now, if you notice the stopwatch hand is running along merrily and I stop it and I know how long the event took. Now, this is actually a little bit fancier. This is what they call a flyback. So while I'm using it, I can actually push it. It'll reset and continue to run. So if I'm timing uh, multiple rapid events, I can just simply hit the flyback and it will work. It also works uh, for a let's wait until it actually starts so you can have an exact start and release and you have that uh, instant second hand. So this allows you to make a uh, 
chronograph as uh, pretty much as accurate as you're going to need in the real world. Again, analog. So now we've talked about a little bit on the window displays and uh, timing. Let's look at some when some functions that are not directly timed. Like in this case, here's an Omega. This Omega uh, Globemaster is also an annual calendar. Shows you the date and it shows you the month. See, one of the elegant things about an analog presentation is uh, it can be used for multiple things like 12 hours in the day, 12 months in the year. So you can have the spaces between the indices show the month. So this allows you to have a very elegant and clean display, but it still tells you the month and the day. And you've got, of course, running second hand, hour hand, and minute hand. So here we have a quarter to nine on April the 16th. Now, another hand that you'll see on a watch that doesn't directly have to do with time. Oh, come on, zoom in on me. Get some focus. No, focus. Another, another function that you're going to see on a watch that doesn't directly relate to time is a power reserve. That tells you how much um, energy is still in the spring in a wind-up watch. In this case, this is a Seiko spring drive, which they, even though it is an electronic um, regulation for the escapement, it uses a, a, a mechanical spring to drive the whole movement because it uses the parasitic energy from the um, braking mechanism within the electronics. I have a whole video where I rant about people who don't understand that. Um, but in this case, they want to emphasize that you get 70 uh, odd power hours of power reserve. It tells you that you have 70 hours that you can wind this watch up, put it to the side. In this case, it, I, it's drained. I haven't uh, worn this in a while. But uh, if I wound it up right now, that power reserve will go up pretty quickly, actually because they've got a pretty efficient winding mechanism in this Seiko. So as you see, not only is the power reserve going up, but the second hand kicked in because, of course, uh, once the mechanism uh, gets to a certain uh, tightness, it actually pushes everything along, as it were. And in the case of the uh, Seiko spring drive, that smooth second hand is wild. Uh, in the case of the Seiko Spring Drive, it's got hours, minutes, and seconds. So here it's showing um, 8 to 9, and the second hand is running smoothly, and the uh, power reserve shows about uh, 30 hours of power. So you've got time, and then this, uh, they call it a complication. In fact, the whole word complication comes from watches, because each function in a watch is called a complication. So when you say something is complicated, it means it's got a lot of uh, moving parts, as it were, comes directly from watches. And well, clocks actually. Watches are a new fangled thing. Clocks have been around for a long time. So hours, minutes, seconds, power reserve. Now, um, another display that you might see, uh, in the case of this watch, here's another example of a, uh, this is a GMT watch that it shows a second time zone in this subdial, this little subdial here. Let me move. This is also a, like I said, the higher end watches have jumping hours on their travel watches. This also has a jumping hour hand. And then that lets you see the subdial. This is the uh, second time zone subdial that is this big red hand on the GMT. So the Mont Blanc uses a small dial to give the same information. So the only consistent dial, the only consistent hands you're going to see on a watch, consistent, seriously consistently, are the hour and the minute hands. All the other hands are up for grabs, pretty much, because they're secondary information. So on this watch, the uh, secondary time zone is in a subdial, and on this watch, the secondary time zone is in the outer bezel. Right, so let's put this back to normal. Close that up. And um, one last watch I'd like to show before we close this out is a regulator. Now, a regulator is a type of watch that um, shows you the time by having a completely separate dial for each 
of the uh, aspects of time, as it were. Hours, minutes, seconds. What I like about this piece, and there'll be a review about this one coming up as well, too, is that uh, it's a sports regulator, which is interesting because regulators were created originally for uh, train conductors and boat captains and people who it was critically important to know exactly what time it is at a glance. Because, for example, if I take a watch like this, a regular watch with hands, and I have it uh, here, it confuses you as to what time it is. Follow? So, for example, um, is that 10 after 2? Is it, you know, you, it's, in some cases it's pretty apparent because of the time of day, but sometimes it's not because of the way the hands can be positioned. Right? So a regulator gets away from that issue entirely because the hour hand can't be overlapped by the minute hand, the second hand can't overlap the minute hand, all of, the, all of the hands have their own place, so you can see at a glance that in this case, uh, it's 1137 on this regulator. Um, cue the Warren G joke if you would like at this stage. So, these two watches display the exact same information. Well, this has a second hand, but uh, so then I should say, uh, find something with a second hand that also doesn't have a date, don't have one happen to handy, so we'll just do this. See, so these two watches uh, both have hours, minutes, and seconds, but these are what they call central hours, minutes, and seconds, and this is a regulator. So they show the same information just differently, but minute hand, hour hand. It's going to be consistent on everything. So, that's our uh, little chat about telling time on watches. I hope you uh, got something out of it. And if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll uh, try to include that information in an upcoming video. So let's uh, turn the camera around and um, close out the episode. So, that was uh, how to tell time on a uh, watch with hands using various uh, watches in the collection. I hope it was informative. I hope I wasn't uh, too uh, fast or complex or hard to follow. If you have any questions, uh, give me a call or uh, leave me a message and I'll be more than happy to reach out to you individually or just tell me your opinions on what you think about the importance of having a watch with hands. I mean, I think that it goes far beyond uh, telling time. So, you all have a great day and thanks for taking the time to uh, watch the channel. Please subscribe.